We've been joined by uh, Secretary Chu, who's our Secretary of Energy, and he's responsible, among many things, for executing the President and therefore the American people's energy agenda. He is a distinguished scientist and a co-winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1997. Uh, he's devoted his recent scientific career to the search that we all are so eager uh, to see uh, concluded uh, to our energy challenges, uh, to new for new energy technologies, and for stopping global climate change. And uh, he's, as the Secretary of Energy, uh, shouldered uh, that mission as Secretary as well. He's helped the administration jumpstart clean energy economy uh, initiatives through programs such as ARPA-E, which is similar to DARPA, which I think some of you have heard about, and the Secretary may talk about that. Uh, we were together at the ARPA-E conference just south of here about a month ago, and he's been to Colorado on a number of occasions uh, to educate Coloradans and to dream about what our energy future uh, could possibly be. Uh, I just had a chance to say hello to the Secretary, and I was reminded just standing there with him that he was the leader really in the end of, of the team that put an end to the leak in the Gulf, the Deepwater Horizon uh, uh, explosion that we all lived through for those number of months uh, last year. And Secretary Chu was brought in as a scientist, as an engineer, uh, and he uh, in many ways helped figure out how to stop that leak. So when we get to questions, you might ask him about that uh, team and that mission that he undertook. So would you all please welcome Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu. Oh, thank you, Senator Udall. Um, I was told that um, just to keep it informal and to mostly let uh, time to answer questions and that perhaps you'd like to know what the Department of Energy does. Um, so let me, let me very briefly on a high level say what it does. It, it does many things. It, it's responsible for the nuclear security of our country, uh, the roots of the Department of Energy uh, where the Atomic Energy Commission and many of the roots of the lab started with the Manhattan Project and, and the scientific organizations before that. So we, uh, so the short line there is uh, we're responsible for the nukes, don't mess with us. Uh, the, we are also responsible for the legacy of the nuclear weapons program. During the Cold War, there was a lot of environmental damage and uh, we are responsible for cleaning it up. Um, so that's another thing we take very seriously. We are responsible, we're the biggest funder of the physical sciences in the United States, uh, from basic research to mission-oriented research to uh, getting innovative solutions to energy. Uh, probably not known, but we've funded the work of more Nobel laureates than any other funding agency in the world not in the United States, in the world, bar none, uh, over 80. Um, in addition to that, we funded and supported and trained a cadre of scientists over more than half a century uh, that went on to get Nobel Prizes. The lab that I uh, was a director of, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, was um, uh, started in the 1930s uh, by the inventor of the cyclotron. I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley in, from 1970 to 76. Between 76 and 78, I was a graduate student and a postdoc. And they made me an assistant professor, but they said, you can also take a leave of absence or you can start your group. Uh, the leave of absence was 26 years, but never mind that. <laughs> so I was trained at Berkeley Lab. I was an employee at Berkeley Lab while I was a graduate student. And I was one of about 30 young scientists, graduate students, postdocs, or early career people who were trained at Berkeley Lab, who went on to get Nobel Prizes. Right. Uh, so, and, and people who were permanent employees of the lab, not who used the facilities, but actually worked there, uh, 12 of them got Nobel Prizes. So, but I think the most impressive one is 30 were trained there. Okay, so that's probably not appreciated within uh, the larger public community. Then finally, and this is appreciated, I hope, we feel we're responsible for the entire innovation chain from the research that will actually make available the possibility of discoveries to 
to the development of technologies that can lead to a sustainable energy future. It is just not one of those things we do. It is really a central part of what we do because the world is shifting and is realizing that uh, for a number of reasons, we will have to transition to a clean energy future. Um, when I see countries like China, over only in the last couple of years, uh, totally focusing uh, whatever national investments are on the, everything having to do with uh, cleaner energy. And now why are they doing this? Well, uh, partly they're choking from their own pollution, their normal pollution. Partly they realize that there's gonna be a huge international market. Well, how big? Well, in the United States, we spend about a trillion dollars a year on just primary energy, but if you include all the investments, uh, it's several trillion. So it's, it's a five, ten trillion dollar a year market worldwide. So they also say, hey, this is great. But in order to develop those technologies that they want to sell abroad, they're now the leader in solar cell exports around the world. We were the leader when it didn't matter in 1995 or 6. It didn't matter because it was a small industry. It matters now. And if those of you are following it, the cost of photovoltaics has dropped by 50% in the last five years. It's dramatic. It's still too expensive relative to fossil fuel if you just say everything else being equal without subsidy. But we expect within the next decade it will drop by another 50%. Now, why can I say that with assurance? Because we talk to every company out there, national, international, and their business plan says we've got to get our price down. And this is not the module, this is full cost. The installation cost, the electronics, the labor to install. That will drop by 50%. We think it might drop by 70, 75%. In fact, we looked at what was happening. All these companies said, if we can't meet this, we're gonna be out of business. That's okay. Now, if it drops by 70%, this is very good news because that means without subsidy, Solar can compete with any form of new energy, gas, coal, you name it. And it could be local, it could be put on warehouses, it can be on rooftops. It can be, the rooftops will be the last. Uh, right now, when I say it's dropped by 50%, it's dropped by 50% for large scale uh, deployment. Large scales like tens of or hundreds of megawatts. We think um, uh, within a year or two, I'm pretty sure that it will be, at the smaller scale, the rooftops of warehouses will be the same price as today's deserts. But the good news there is it's built up space. It's in the city. You don't have to build transmission lines. You don't have to worry about desert tortoises and leave me lizards and the usual stuff. Uh, you know, it's just a rooftop. <laughs> and so that's good. Um, wind, you just go down the list. Uh, another uh, thing near and dear to my heart are, are electric vehicles. Right now, you can, they're, they're expensive. Um, if you really want to shell out money, you can $110,000 get you a Tesla, which I'm told goes zero to 60 in uh, three and a half seconds. Um, I actually sat in one of these and got a test ride. And I have to tell you, it's, it's like a Lotus, the car, it's this carbon fiber car. And I'm think I'm pretty spry. And getting out of that thing is like getting out of a tight-fitting glove and where you're lying on the ground. So it's not a mass market car. <laughs> so uh, what's a mass market car? Well, you know, Chevy Volt's a mass market car, but it's, 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 uh, it's uh, more money than many people want to spend. So let me tell you what's coming down the pike. The battery in the Chevy Volt is a first-generation battery actually built on intellectual property developed at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, that battery, it's being manufactured by LG Chem, a Korean company, but what is happening is we're bringing manufacturing of these batteries back to the United States. The American car companies are now beginning to invest in a big way in developing the technology. It used to be that Japan is the leader in advanced batteries. Then Korea got in, so it was a fight between Japan and Korea. Even though we invented, an American invented the lithium ion battery, we weren't in the game for the last 30 years. We've come back into the game. That's really great news. 
in large part due to some funding uh, in the Department of Energy. Now, when we, we're looking at battery manufacturing across uh, the world and across the country, and I have a little bit of knowledge in this because I was, uh, before I came here and took my vow of poverty, I was uh, on <laughs> a couple of scientific boards, on a couple of boards, I was on a lot of things, and one of them was a, uh, a scientific board of a battery company. So I knew what some of the competition was doing, I knew what this battery company was doing, and I gotta tell you, in the last three or four years, it's been transformational. The competition, the ingenuity, most of the great ideas are American, being developed here. So there's a 50% chance that within five or six years we will be testing batteries that can maybe go 300 miles, one third the cost, one third the volume. Okay, there's a, a very high probably, 80% or higher, half the cost, half the volume, 200 miles. Okay, and there's a small probability, because it's still very research, that we can go 400 miles in a single charge in a $20,000 car. Oh, okay, now, just imagine, $20,000 car, you get to plug it in, go three or 400 miles. That, in today's gasoline prices and today's electricity prices, that's one-fifth of the cost. And it can last 15 years. That would be transformational. Now, uh, but we don't have extraordinary vision. Um, Korea sees this, Japan sees this, the European Union sees this, and China especially sees this. So it is a race. It's a race where the stakes are higher than the race to the moon. In fact, the whole clean energy race is a race which the stakes are much higher. So we are responsible as best we can, whatever funds, Senator, are you listening? Whatever funds <laughs> the House and Senate want to give us, uh, we think that this is going to be uh, a real foundation of the future prosperity of the United States. We need to bring back manufacturing in the United States. We used to be the leader in manufacturing. It's people like Ford who invented the assembly line, it just transformed manufacturing. Um, we lost that lead. We lost the lead in high-tech manufacturing and exports. About five or six years ago, guess who's the winner now? Or the leader, China. China, the European Union, if you compare the European Union, US and China as the three major players, all of the European Union, European Union remained flat, we went down, China went up, China passes. There's no reason in the world we can't take that lead back. High-tech, high-quality manufacturing. Germany has high-tech, high-quality manufacturing, and you know, person for person, they're ahead of us, all right? And if you look at their labor structure and everything else like that, okay. Uh, so, uh, part of our job in the Department of Energy is to make sure uh, that we provide those early inventions and early development and assist in this early thing that can actually, so we can give it to the private sector, they can run with it. Uh, that's another thing we do. So that just gives you a flavor for what we have to do. I tell my employees that, look, um, you know, when things are tough and when there's all this bureaucracy that just, you know, mind-numbing, um, first we're gonna get rid of the bureaucracy, the mind-numbing bureaucracy, but secondly, you just have to remember you're responsible for the future prosperity of the United States. <laughs> so don't mess up, we can't mess up. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Uh, uh, and we are. <laughs> and so, uh, and it's, you know, okay, there's a little pressure, but what the heck? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, uh, people rise to the occasion and the department is rising to the occasion. One last thing. We are in a time of terrible fiscal uh, stresses. We have a huge deficit. We have to attend to this deficit. Uh, and so we've got to make choices. And uh, what we want, of course, is not across the board cuts. We have to make cuts. But I will say that in terms of the future of the United States, not the future 20 or 30 years from today. I mean, I'm talking about the future one year, two years from today. The future is tomorrow and beyond. Uh, 
we need to, to, to continue to invest in those things which we really think are investments and not expenditures. And if you look back in American history, uh, I'll point out two times of incredible stress. One was um, in the 50s and 60s. And that was a dark time because we were in the 50s and 60s, we were in the deepest, darkest parts of the Cold War and the buildup. Uh, there was a time when there were 70,000 warheads, Soviet Union and US aimed at each other, and a few other scattered targets. Each warhead of those 70,000, each warhead, uh, if you took the average of the explosive power of a single warhead, was more than all the bombs dropped by the Allies, not the US, the Allies, in World War II, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's a lot of stuff. We lived through it. We were behind in the space race with Sputnik. In 1957, Sputnik is the word Jim means satellite, but this Sputnik really shocked America because it, you know, it was clear that the Soviet Union's rocket scientists, their, their German rocket scientists were better than our German rocket scientists. And, and uh, then they put a, uh, the first man in orbit, Yuri Gagarin, years before we could put someone in orbit. It was clear we were behind. What was the response to Sputnik? It was Eisenhower was president. One of, the, one of two five-star generals in the history of the US. He could have just said we'd spend a lot of money on defense and rockets. He didn't. He said we're gonna spend a lot of money on science and engineering education, including K through 12. That's, this is amazing. In 1957, a five-star general, former five-star general would say that. And through those programs that really put the pedal to the floor, a number, of many, many young people, including myself, benefited from those high school programs and college programs and graduate school programs. Many of us remember, wow, Sputnik. First, it was a call to go into science and engineering. Secondly, uh, it supported many of us uh, and trained many of us with various programs, okay? And then when Kennedy uh, became president, and we were still behind. He said, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. It's really bad. The economy was in a recession, you name it. He says, despite all that, we wanted to be the first to put a man on the moon. He could have easily said, we're stressed. Let's not do that. But he didn't, okay? Now, even darker time in US history, the darkest time was during the Civil War. And a year after Abraham Lincoln became president, he signed a bill that created a company, one of the companies uh, that, uh, that started the transcontinental railroad system and started subsidizing with land grants and with some subsidies to build the transcontinental railroad system during the Civil War. And a year and a half later, he started the National Academy of Sciences, a body that would be giving science advice to the federal government. Boy, if there's any time to say, I can't do this stuff, that was then, okay? So we have in our culture and in our heritage and in our past, even in the darkest of times, or it seemed to be the darkest of times, we have to have an eye on the future. And it's that eye in the future that paid dividends in the decades to come. The Sputnik education program generate a cadre of scientists and engineers that kept us in the forefront, in the lead, in the last half of the 20th century. Make no doubt about it. Okay, we, were the, we were on top. Now, the good news is we still have that intellectual horsepower. But we need to start programs where the young people, the people in college and high school today will see it's a new Sputnik era, it's a new time, and it's a new challenge. Uh, but it's an equally exciting thing. The stakes are at least as high. And it's ours to lose. It really is ours to lose. So that's what the Department of Energy does. All right, I'll be glad to take questions.
Well, we, uh, we certainly are putting a lot into the development of next generation lithium ion batteries. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, at this moment, if, if there's a statute that says an airplane is not a vehicle, I can, you know, first blush believe that, but by vehicle they mean an automobile or a truck. <laughs> um, and so certainly, uh, have you talked to our battery people? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it depends again because a lot of the things we develop in in lithium-ion batteries, and we're actually there's a number of batteries we're looking beyond lithium-ion uh, that would be even lighter weight, higher energy density. Uh, it, it, although you know, the, the, a major focus would be on batteries uh, for vehicles, you know, plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles. These things can easily be adapted for any other use, including, by the way. Uh, uh, utility scale energy storage. Um, right now, you wouldn't ever think of doing lithium ion battery for utility scale storage. I mean, megawatts, tens of megawatt and megawatt hours, but, but uh, that crossover point is going to happen in the next couple of years. And, and that alone would probably save about 2% of our electricity. Because we throw away so much electricity, we overfill, and if we can't use it, we dump it in the ground. Now, if we can't use it, you can put it in a battery and then and then bring it up five minutes later, two minutes later. Uh, but, but, you know, maybe uh, if uh, Ian is somewhere here, you can, he can get your card. And we'll, it, he's right behind you. Okay. Yes? Right. Um, so the question, uh, there's a statement that said China's been increasing its spending on energy 20% per year, and how can we catch up with that? Um, well, a couple things. First, I don't know if it's 20% per year, but I know in 2010, the three leading countries in energy investments were uh, China, United, China, Germany, the United States, in that order. I believe it's that order. But that was included Recovery Act, okay, which was huge. It was uh, 26 billion. Um, I think what we, I don't think we're going to be able to catch up with that in the sense of the federal dollars because you know Recovery Act level spending just won't happen. That's not realistic. But what we can do is we can set the policies in place that we can get private investments to to actually make those investments. Uh, the private sector, if shown the right direction, uh, will make those investments. Right now, there's a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines uh, because there's a very uncertain markets. You know, what's going to happen? Uh, I mean, just the flight to gold tells you that. You know, people, you know, buying gold is like putting money under your mattress. And uh, so, so I think if we get some policies that actually say this is the way we're going to go, whether they be uh, tax benefits or whether they be uh, renewable portfolio standards or clean energy standards is what the president's called for, those are all things that create a market draw. And it doesn't really pick a winner, for example. It doesn't say you've got to buy some solar, you've got to buy some wind, or you know, coal, coal, if it's carbon captured and sequestered, will count. The fraction it is, natural gas will count half, nuclear will count. So it doesn't actually care, but it, it's an incentive to the utility companies, the power generators, that, that they have these very old generating plants held together by Band-Aids, completely depreciated. So on the books, it looks like, you know, well, they're making money because they're completely depreciated, but they're being held together by Band-Aids, and they've been grandfathered in, um, because many of them are 40, 50 years old. And uh, they're grandfathered in, so they don't have to uh, adhere to the Clean Air Act of the early 90s. So I think, you know, so they know they're going to retire. A little nudge to get them to retire sooner rather than later and make reinvestments, which will create jobs in the United States, will clean up our air, and, and drive us to actually greater efficiency. These coal plants are very inefficient. 
okay? And, the, and, and so, you, so you're putting in a new infrastructure that's much more energy efficient, and it will be competitive in the long run. But right now, you know, the local county says, it's okay, let's just struggle for another couple of years. It's your old jalopy. Uh, the maintenance is getting higher and higher, but it's still, you know. <laughs> so, yes? Okay, so the question was uh, about peak oil, you know, how real is it, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. Okay, so, so let, me, let me just say that um, there's a prediction of peak oil in the United States uh, that turned out to be more or less true. Um, but it's different because when oil recovery became too expensive in the United States, you just look around the rest of the world and say, okay, where can I go to get cheaper oil? And so that was the market force there. Now, if you take the whole world, uh, you have a different situation. And the different situation is if right now oil is the almost virtually uh, sole transportation fuel with some minor bits on the edge, okay? As long as the only way we're going to get around with driving our cars and trucks, airplanes and our boats, and the fundamental uh, 90 plus percent is coming from oil, uh, and you're not going to give up transportation, uh, this is going to create a demand. And the demand is dominated by, the increased demand is completely dominated by the developing countries. U.S. oil demand is essentially flat, very close to flat, Europe very close to flat, and projections are close to flat. It's China followed by India. Uh, and so what happens is if the price, first the technology gets better and better. It used to be if you just dug a hole in the ground and you know, got what popped up, you'd get 5% of the reserve. They got better and better, then you got to 10%, 20%. Now it's, you're doing badly unless you can get 30, 40% of the oil in the ground. Uh, with a good high-tech oil company, you're getting 50% on average, and some people are going to 70%, okay? So that technology is going to get better. However, even with that, the current reserves that we're using pumping out now, we know they will peak and decline. The major reserves of Saudi Arabia, there was beautiful, they're, they're in decline. Saudi Arabia has other oil fields, the Tarir oil, higher lifting costs, but they're still pretty cheap compared to the rest of the world. And that's what's happening internationally. You're going deeper offshore, one mile deep in Macondo. Uh, there's a major oil find off the coast of Brazil, two miles deep before you go into the ground and another couple miles. The oil platforms when you do this are pretty expensive. Shell's new platform in the Gulf, uh, I think is about four or five billion dollars, one platform. Um, but the technology is getting better, and so, and you're going to less traditional oil, tarrier oil, probably sour, sour means more sulfur oil. And so what I don't see is a peak and a decline. What I see is a thing, and then the price will adjust, and as the price goes higher and the technology gets better, you will go after harder to get stuff, more expensive stuff. So there'll be a plateau, long plateau. Um, now, that's the bad news the price will go higher in the long run because the demand is going up and, and oil is a finite source. So I, I would say America and the rest of the world take note of that. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. Right now we're suffering greatly from the price of oil and the price of gasoline. But don't expect that we go back to $2 gasoline and $50 oil in the long run. Nobody should expect that. Just supply and demand issues and, and where you're now going for oil. So what do you do? You diversify your transportation solutions, electric vehicles, biofuels, and biofuels, you know, fourth generation biofuels, where the energy investments are far less than what we have to do in investing into things like corn. We 
we need a number of things like that. We have natural gas. And uh, I, for one, believe that we can frack safely, environmentally, responsibly way. But, w and by the way, the fracking is increasing our oil um, generation in the United States. It went up half a million barrels in the last couple of years, oil fracking, shale fracking. It's going to go up at least to a million in a couple of years, barrels a day. Okay? So, so it's because the technology is getting better, but the price is something different. So we should diversify our supply. Think of, can we use natural gas? Oh, certainly electric vehicles, because when we go, because that makes it a lot easier, you know, renewables plus nuclear plus some fossil will, will, will drive that. And, and, if, and if oil becomes a third of our transportation, it's a totally different world. And if oil becomes a third of transportation supply, energy supply for China and US and a couple other major countries, it will transform the geopolitics of the world as well. So there's many, many reasons why you want to diversify. And that's why the Department of Energy is so focused on this. Uh, we've got to diversify the energy supply. And it's going to be technology that's going to tell us how to do this. Sure. So, um, as you know, the way it works is that um, the president puts forward a budget um, and Congress has to enact it, and it starts with the House. And as it works through the House and then the Senate, the agencies, so, so they, they give us the money and we're supposed to spend it wisely. We're the executors of the taxpayer money, if you will. And so, in that role, we have to work with Congress and, and discussion with Congress about what should be the priorities um, in the budgets. I personally feel that the more latitude we have, uh, the better we can spend the money in the wisest way possible. But, you know, pushing against that, I think people in Congress also feel that it is their uh, duty uh, to, to uh, you know, it's not their job to give us a blank check. And so they have to decide under, you know, what bushels and baskets, what to do. And so we need to work with them in order to decide, uh, you know, how much you want to spend in, um, you know, chemical research for this, uh, or just office of science. That's our more fundamental basic science light sources. How much you want to spend on energy efficiency or the development of energy technologies closer to uh, commercialization. And so, so Congress works with us in trying to figure out this. Uh, sometimes they work against us, but never mind. <laughs> but so do all the branches of the federal government, <laughs> of the executive part of the federal government, but never mind that. So, so, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question regarding, you know, there, so there's a, an interplay back and forth. And I will be in senators and congressmen's offices or uh, people working in the Department of Energy to say, okay, the, uh, this is what we think should happen. Uh, uh, so that's the way the system works. Um, um, and uh, what was the other part of your question? Nat national energy policy. That's a tougher one uh, because. You've got one minute. I've got one minute. Um, well, there, since energy touches everybody and since uh, people's appetites for certain solutions are uh, geographically, they're geographical actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's say the Northeast states and the Southeast states and the Western states will have different appetites for different forms of energy. And, so that's one thing that you just have to be wary of. The price of energy across the United States differs widely. Uh, and that actually is something that, you know, the states have inexpensive energy, feel that that's their backbone. Uh, 
But there are states in a next by, nearby state where the price of electricity might be twice as high. Um, if you had more of a transmission distribution, would, you could raise the lower states, you lower the upper states. Overall, the average would go down because you would use your generation and distribution um, investments much more wisely. But we don't have that. And so that's one of the things that we, we've got to work on um, because the overall average will go down and we can use it much more efficiently, have a much more efficient system. Uh, European countries are beginning to have these interplays with better coordination than our states. <laughs> so, so, but it's a challenge and, and, and we are, that's one of the things uh, that I really want to do before I leave is to really get a, a process going to, to get all the players to, to play with each other. So I, I think uh, the hook has come. <laughs> I, Dr. Dr. Chu, I think I, I speak for everybody here in, in acknowledging uh, your public service, your intelligence. I, I think you all, don't you feel inspired listening to Dr. Chu? Um, and uh, I, I hope, and I don't say this as a Democrat, I just hope that you continue to serve as long as we can possibly keep you here uh, heading this crucial uh, arm of the federal government. Uh, so thanks again for taking the time to be here. Talk to my wife. Okay, talk. <laughs>